After a turbulent 2022, what are the big political challenges for the United Kingdom this year? Hello, I'm Arnold Nider and this is The Heat. The United Kingdom was rattled by political crisis last year and it also had to deal with major economic issues. The country saw three different prime ministers come through 10 Downing Street in less than two months. Meanwhile, thousands stick to the streets and there were strikes by workers in the rail and healthcare sectors. Still, in his New Year's message, the current British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was positive about the future. In this historic year of His Majesty the King's coronation, we will come together with pride in everything that makes this country great. Yes, 2023 will have its challenges, but the government I lead is putting your priorities first. There is a lot to discuss, so let's get to it. Joining me now from London is Jonathan Liss. He is a political commentator and journalist. Also with us is Wayne Fitzgerald. He is the city council leader for the English city of Peterborough. With us, too, from London is Robert Odes. He is director of the Bruges Group, a think tank based in the United Kingdom. And from Maryland, also joining the discussion, is Laura Beers. She is a professor of British history at American University. Welcome to all of you to the show. Jonathan, let's, let me start with you. Lots of gloom and doom coming out of the United Kingdom. But let's start with some good news. New economic numbers show a very slight uptick in GDP growth for November in the United Kingdom. And pay rises, according to the British state broadcast of the BBC, are at the fastest pace for 20 years. But the big question is, can the UK avoid a recession? Well, I mean, it's funny that you should mention those pieces of good news because the atmosphere in Britain is pretty gloomy. I would say dire, actually. We have uh, the worst industrial relations for decades. We have something approaching a general strike where every week new industries are going on strike. We had an unprecedented uh, nurse strike, an ambulance strike, and those are continuing. We now uh, have a, a mass teacher strike beginning, uh, ongoing strikes uh, in, the, in the postal service. Um, border control uh, and in the, on the railways as well. Um, because even though wages are rising, as you're saying, they are rising by much less than inflation. And so people are still getting real terms pay cuts. And that follows 13 years of wage squeezes under the Conservatives. So it doesn't feel as though anything is getting better. And that, those, that uh, economic growth that you talk about, I think is 0.1% or something like that. And so it still seems very likely that Britain will be in recession, as the Bank of England has forecast, and indeed, as Rishi Sunak himself has said, is likely. And so things are not looking good at the start of this year. Wayne, what do you make of it? As Jonathan says, the atmosphere in the United Kingdom is gloomy, dire. Uh, Rishi Sunak, the new Prime Minister, is under a lot of pressure. Uh, he's promised to halve inflation this year. Can he do it? And has he been the kind of stabilizing factor that Britain needs after the last two months of political unrest chaos, really? Certainly the Conservative Party thinks so. I was in conversation today with the party chairman, along with 40-odd other council leaders up and down the country. So the party feels like it has stabilized the economy and is investing in the economy. The Prime Minister has been quite clear about the objectives of his administration, which is to halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt, uh, cut NHS waiting lists and stop small boats. But to some degree, you know, what Jonathan paints is a gloomy picture. It depends on how you're viewing it. But the UK is not alone in this. It's not something that just affects the UK. I think it's worldwide that there is a, shall we say, challenge in the economies of all the major countries in the world. But, you know, the Conservatives have a strong record. I'll admit to, you know, a blip in the last six, nine months. But overall, the Conservatives will bring us through to a stronger economy. But what's happening in the world is not making that easy right now. Jonathan, Wayne says the Conservatives have a strong record. Do you buy that? Well, I wouldn't say that the last six years have been a glittering, uh, you know, sort of a, 
pr appraisal of the Conservative Party. Um, first of all, with the Brexit, the hard Brexit, which is obviously privileged sovereignty and illusion of sovereignty over the economy, uh, which is you know, the, the Office of Budget Responsibilities forecast is going to knock 4% of GDP in the long term. Look, obviously, there are challenges which we share with other countries, such as COVID. Um, being, and the Ukraine war being, uh, you know, principal among them. But Britain uh, is facing a longer and deeper recession than any of its uh, comparative uh, economies and, and neighbours. Uh, and we have to accept that the Conservatives have done very badly. And, you know, so Wayne glosses over the disastrous premiership of Liz Truss, which did so much to damage uh, Britain's economic credibility in the wake of uh, that disastrous Brexit, by the way, uh, which people are still not prepared to talk about very much in Britain. Uh, so Rishi Sunak has his work cut out for him, but simply sort of cutting inflation in half is not going to help the cost of living crisis because wages are still not rising in line with inflation now. And inflation being halved doesn't mean the price is going to go back to where they were. It simply means the price is going to stop rising as fast. That's not going to help people who are struggling with prices as they are at the moment. Robert, the United Kingdom has been hit by a series of strikes. We had uh, nurses and ambulance workers going on strike. And there's a lot of debate, as uh, Jonathan told us a moment ago, over the future of the National Health Service. Um, this is a health service which is the pride of England. Uh, let's listen to what the opposition Labour leader, Keir Starmer, had to say. The government has broken the health system. Yeah. Ask anyone in the NHS. They will tell you they don't have enough staff. 133,000 vacancies. And there's an obvious solution. Scrap the non-DOM status and use the money to bring through the next generation of doctors and nurses. That's what Labour would do. Mr Speaker, we're already investing billions more in the NHS. We're already hiring thousands more doctors and nurses. So, Robert, nurses are set to strike again uh, in the United Kingdom. I mean, what is causing this labour unrest? Is there some kind of a solution in sight? Well, contrary to what Jonathan says, there's not going to be a general strike. The TUC have ruled that out. Of course, what has happened in the UK is for decades now under Labour and Conservative governments, an economy has been built on low productivity, low wage jobs. That has, of course, been, in a sense, supported by the government and uh, benefits have been there to top up low earnings rather than actually encouraging employers to pay more. Immigrants have been brought in, cheap labour essentially, to keep those wages low. That is now ending. And of course, we have a period of high inflation and naturally people are pushing back and going on strike demanding more pay. Of course, there is, a, as you say, record pay being given, but it is below the rate of inflation. However, that rate of inflation will come down because oil prices are going down, the wholesale gas prices are going down. So the um, push factors in the economy driving inflation should reduce throughout 2023. And by 2024, hopefully the economy will be back to normal and growing at a substantial or respectable rate rather than, the, lot, than the, the, the poor rate of growth that we've had recently and indeed some negative economic growth, though we're not in a recession, although that no doubt will emerge at some point. Uh, there'll be the, the two quarters of negative economic growth. That will probably indeed happen unless, of course, Rishi Sunak can be lucky and these fuel prices remain low. And then, of course, we'll see a very different economic situation emerge and there will be less inflation and less demand for strikes and, and excessive pay increases, which at this point in time can't be afforded by the public sector because, of course, the government, as a result of excessive spending, has now got GDP, uh, debt to GDP at 100%, which is unsustainable mm -hmm. in the long run and needs to be addressed. And that's the big crisis that we're facing the, the amount of debt the country's in. Laura Beers, uh, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Uh, Britain has gone through a very tumultuous year if we look at what has happened in 2022. And as I said, we had three prime ministers in a very short space of time. There was the death of the Queen. Of course, there are the strikes that have taken place, the threat of more strikes to take place. I mean, how much 
pressure is the UK under right now? What do you see ahead? In the UK economy is in a fragile place, and I think Jonathan was right in saying that um, we've sort of glossed over the premiership of Liz Truss and the damage that it's done, in that the cost of living crisis in Britain is not just a consequence of rising fuel prices in the war in Ukraine, which are a global phenomenon. Um, Britain is very much exposed to the international economy, that much more so after leaving the European Union. Um, the British economy is also very heavily reliant on the housing sector, um, which took a big hit under Liz Truss as the cost of borrowing went up in reaction to some of the policies that her um, administration announced during its brief tenure, leading to rises in mortgage rates and higher cost of bargaining or borrowing, which had a negative impact on the government's debt to GDP ratio, um, as well as having a negative impact on homeowners mortgage payments if their mortgages were, were floating or up for renegotiation. And all of these put pressure on the cost of living in ways that are not going to be redressed just by a fall of inflation, which, as Jonathan rightly points out, doesn't mean that prices aren't going up. It means they're not going up quite as fast. And, um, and as the point was also made, though these strikes, some of them have resulted in, in pretty impressive settlements for those who've gone out on strike, those settlements have, at best, um, kept workers treading water and, for the most part, losing ground compared to a rapidly escalating cost of living in the United Kingdom. Jonathan, Robert made the point just a moment ago saying that wages uh, are under pressure for workers in the public sector because the government is essentially short of money. They uh, don't have the funds to pay those things. So how is this going to be resolved? Well, I think you can argue the points about whether the government has enough money. The government has enough money uh, to fund uh, an energy bill, uh, energy bills being capped um, through, throughout the country. It has enough money to, to pay furlough for millions of people during COVID. It has enough, had enough money to, to leave the European Union, which is actually a very costly endeavour. So, you know, Theresa May's famous line about the magic money tree is actually not true. There is a magic money tree when the government... Um, sees fit to, to, to plant one, and when investors um, are satisfied that it's a legitimate magic money tree, because obviously we have our own central bank, uh, we can print money. That's not to say that there aren't any limits on what we can do, as Liz Trust demonstrated. But when the government is being responsible, uh, investors and markets are perfectly happy mm -hmm. that the British government spend and borrow a lot of money. So I think that obviously you have in the strikes uh, an initial uh, negotiation. You have an initial uh, sort of offer. Uh, so nurses are asking for 19 percent. That doesn't mean that they would only accept 19 percent, of course. But the government has been incredibly uh, reluctant to even sit down with the unions, which is extraordinary. I don't understand it. I mean, it's not just that that is hurting users of those services, namely patients in the NHS. Yeah. But it's also politically very damaging because the longer these strikes go on, the more they become associated with the Conservative government. Yeah. Uh, and you have a, a 1970-style situation, a winter of discontent, if yeah. you like, where this idea that the government, Britain isn't working, things aren't going well in right. the country. And it kind of echoes the 1979 Conservative election poster, Labour isn't working, yeah. uh, which obviously was or the Labour Party isn't working and also Labour, the Labour force isn't working and that yeah. ushered in Thatcherism. And so the Conservative government, I don't understand why they're being so passive, because it's absolutely in their interest to solve this problem and do it quickly. Jonathan, uh, you know, workers have taken to the streets. Let's listen to some of what they have been saying. There's a huge cost of living crisis. Inflation is at 12 percent. Wages are really low. And we've got a government which is very unstable. Um, three prime ministers in three months or, you know, four months. Um, and it's quite clear that the government wants to make working people pay for the economic crisis. So we're here to, to fight back. So very briefly, Jonathan, how much of an impact is all of this having on the ordinary working people of the United Kingdom? Well, a massive impact. You know, obviously, a lot of people are striking, as we, as we can see. But there is a huge squeeze on living standards in this country. You know, by some measures, it's you know, the, the worst in 200 years. And so everyone is feeling the pinch. And this cost of living crisis really does cut across society. And it's not just a cost of living crisis, because it's also an absolute uh, existential crisis in the National Health Service. Yeah. I think the government has underestimated just how important that is going to be in people's minds when they look ahead to the next general election likely to be held next year. Because everyone in this country 
will depend on the health service in some respect. Uh, if they get ill or if they, they might get ill at some point, yeah. even if they use private health care, the National Health Service is vital um, for the running of this country. And so everyone is going to feel it. And ultimately, they will blame the government uh, at the day for failures in that health service. You know, a lot of doctors are saying this is not a health service that's on its knees. It's a health service that is now broken, mm. but okay. potentially beyond repair. Okay, I want to move on. Wayne, uh, let's look at what may be some of the factors that contributed to the situation that Britain faces right now. Uh, Brexit continues to be an issue. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is adamant that it was right for Britain, although there are uh, some voices which are being raised, some doubts being expressed. Let's listen to what Rishi Sunak had to say. Uh, under my leadership, the United Kingdom will not pursue any relationship with Europe that relies on alignment with EU laws. Now, I voted for Brexit. I believe in Brexit. And I know that Brexit can deliver, and is already delivering, enormous benefits and opportunities for the country. So, Wayne, some are calling this the greatest slump in a generation, and many are questioning whether Brexit was a good idea. In hindsight, uh, was it a bad move for the United Kingdom to leave the EU? No, the principle of leaving the European Union was for the right reasons, in terms of those principles still remain the same today. It was about securing our borders. It was about free trade economy. In my view, and I've said so before on this program, European trade was going down. It was in decline. The, there was a bigger market in the world. But who could have foreseen a global pandemic? So that got in the way. I mean, hot on the heels within two months of Brexit, we had this thing called COVID-19. And we still have COVID-19. And everybody in the world is unsure about which way that will go. So there is caution. And there's also some trepidation about which way to turn, which route to take. Do we do this policy? Do we that? Do that policy. On top of that, we've had the war in Ukraine and the global economic crisis. Mm. So we are in choppy waters. But was it the right thing to do? I would say, yes, it was. But you've got to look at this in, you know, a 10, 20, 30 year period, not in, you know, 36 months or whatever we are. It's the same view I had uh, at the comment I made about the Conservatives having a good, strong financial record. It's not three years or six months. We're talking about over a sustained period that the Conservatives always ride to the rescue after any Labour government, and that is fact. And when we talk about uh, magic money trees and money, another commentator not five minutes ago said about the levels of debt we have in the United Kingdom, because that's how things are being paid for. And Labour, if they took charge, as they always do, would want to tax everything going. The Conservatives are trying to hold the floodgates back in terms of cost of living crisis and inflation, and wage claims drive those up. It feels in many ways that we're harking back to the 70s, yeah. and almost it, a communist state with the left-wing militant Labour activists, like Mick Lynch, who is getting all the airtime. So there's a wave, and people are riding that wave. And I understand and I sympathise, because I'm an ordinary person. I have pressures on my energy bills, and, you know, we all have to accommodate. But... It is where we are today, and the government are trying to do their best. Labour would be doing far worse. Mick Lynch, uh, of course, one of the leaders of the Railway Workers Union. Robert, what are your thoughts on this? How much of a factor is Brexit playing in current conditions that we find in the United Kingdom? And how important is it for the UK to reshape its trade relationship with the European Union? Well, Britain has officially left the European Union, but the EU legacy laws are, are still in place. That was one of the processes of leaving the EU, is that all European Union laws, um, which many people argued were holding back the economy, were then transposed into, into British law. So in many ways, Britain is still operating as an EU member. And of course, there has been no hard Brexit. There was a very soft agreement with the EU, which kept trade open. Uh, of course, there's issues to do with Northern Ireland, which is essentially a part of the <coughs> European Union single market in all but name. Mm -hmm. And Britain operates as, as such. And so there hasn't really been the divergence between Britain and Europe that uh, one would have hoped and um, what many people no doubt were voting for, because, of course, uh, many of the issues 
that led to Brexit are still very alive. And so to some degree, right. Brexit hasn't been properly completed. Now, of course, just to look at the economic numbers, since Britain voted to leave the European Union, there's more active businesses. Uh, indeed, British trade, uh, export trade is up since Britain left the European Union. Yeah. And also, uh, there is all, you know, the fact that Britain's economic growth, until, of course, the cost of living crisis hit, which has largely been driven by excessive government spending and, of course, the fact that there is no magic money tree and the market yeah. will not allow Britain to borrow any more money, uh, certainly that can't be paid for through taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't rely on the on the economics as they were right. of easy money. Those days are over, and that's where the problem is. Britain had been running a false economy for too long, too much easy money, and of course, future generations pay the price, and we're paying the price now for years of wage restraint caused through uh, reliance on the low productivity jobs when there should have been technology, there should have been tooling, there should have been um, investment in okay, the, Robert, the economy. Uh, Laura, um, we had a lot of talk when the United Kingdom left the European Union. Uh, Boris Johnson talking about a new global Britain. Uh, and we talked about you know, Britain's new place in the world. This, there was a deal that was being talked about at that time, a trade deal between the United Kingdom and the United States. Well, that hasn't materialized. It's not happened. Do you think Brexit hurt the United Kingdom um, and its global standing, really? Well, in that there was a trade deal being talked about by between the United Kingdom and the United States, it was largely being talked about by Boris Johnson. Um, Barack Obama, before the Brexit vote, um, landed himself in some hot water for interfering with the politics of another country by making the point that, it, you know, were Britain to leave the European Union, they would be at the back of the queue to negotiate a trade agreement with the United States. Um, meddling or not, Brexit, the Brexit, Brexit vote was successful. Um, and... And more or less, the United Kingdom has ended up in the back of the queue. It is now, you know, going on seven years after after the vote, and there still is mm -hmm. not a trade agreement with the U.S. Um, as other commentators have remarked, you know, there is a trade agreement in place with the EU, but it's effectively that Britain will largely maintain yeah. the, the standards that they had when they were members of the EU in order to guarantee continued free trade with the European Union. Um, and you look at the major trade agreements there with Japan and Australia. New Zealand, which is just a kind of small fraction of, of the British export and import economy. But these aren't the kind of major deals that were promised back in 2016. Mm. Um, and just to hammer home the point that while Brexit officially happened in 2020, it was pushed back a couple of times. Um, you know, there were four years before COVID struck in which the groundwork was not really laid for a, a brighter future after the Brexit vote. Jonathan, the next general election is uh, two years away, um, and many expect that Labour will win that election. Keir Starmer will become the new Prime Minister. Um, but what kind of division does he have for Britain? Uh, what is he talking about? Would it be also fair to say that right now Labour is pretty deeply divided, isn't it? No, actually, I think Labour is quite united. Um, it's more united than it's been in many years, actually, um, partly because Keir Starmer has purged so much of the left wing of his party, uh, which I personally wouldn't agree with and didn't agree with. But isn't that a uh, sign of division, Jonathan, purging part of your party? Well, it's a sign of division that was there, but a lot of people on the left have, have left the party, and the people that have remained are largely keeping quiet, actually, at the moment. Uh, Keir Starmer faces no significant challenge to his leadership. I fully expect him to lead his party in the next election. Um, that's far from the case. That was far from the case, um, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, when there were big question marks over his leadership. So I think he steadied the boat. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't have problems. Um, he's still not seen as uh, any kind of sort of Blair-like saviour. Mm. The reason the Labour is doing so well is because the Tories are completely imploded uh, under their sort of disastrous uh, sort of. Self, you know, you know self-administered errors, um, unforced errors over the last uh, year and a half, starting with Boris Johnson, of course. And so Starmer has a lot of work to do, but I think he's in a very good position. What he chooses to do with that is another issue. I think he needs to be a lot more radical in in his offer to the British people. Um, he has, you know, a year, a year and a half to to flesh that out. 
Um, but I think that the British people are very fed up with the Conservatives that seem sort of quite tired and exhausted after 13 years. And, you know, just going back to, to what Wayne was saying about taxation, I mean, taxation is currently the highest level um, since the 1940s yeah. under a Conservative government. It's not Labour that's acting like a, a Communist Party, which is completely ridiculous, because Kisama is not in any way, shape or form uh, part of the left. Um, and certainly not a communist, um, but the Conservatives have raised uh, taxation time and time again over the last couple of years, and uh, they've taken this country into recession, what looks like what could be a lengthy recession right. in the months ahead. Wayne, in addition to the economic woes that uh, the United Kingdom faces, um, there's also the problems we see around the monarchy in Britain right now. Of course, this will be a historic year for Britain. We will see the coronation of King Charles. That will happen in May. But... It's become pretty messy, isn't it? We've seen the publication of the memoir by Prince Harry, um, a series of television interviews and a Netflix series that's been very critical of the British royal family. Um, to what, has this really undermined the idea or the family itself in Britain? I don't think so. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm a monarchist. I'm a supporter of the royal family. I believe in king and country, and I did when Her Majesty was alive, of course. And I see these things as just history. You know, you can draw some parallels with Edward and Mrs. Simpson here in terms of, you know, and um, Princess Margaret must have felt many of the things that Prince Harry feels in terms of spare, uh, you know, whatever facts or, okay. or, or, or uh, you put in the crown or confidence you put in the crown as a, as, a, as a work of historical fiction, as it were. There are some elements that ring true. So it's just, you know, you've seen all this before in history. And to me, I feel a great deal of sorrow for Harry and Meghan and also for uh, King Charles and the rest of the royal family that we're having to kind of play this out in public. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure once we get through this, yeah. it's a moment for the tabloid media. It's a feeding <laughs> frenzy. And I just wish it would all go away, really. But it doesn't affect okay. you know, the politics of the UK, really. All right. And that's where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching.